Great. Uh, well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our first lunchtime lecture. Um, this is part of a lunchtime lecture series where we just want to bring people together and give an opportunity to learn, share, and connect uh, with other design members in the design school uh, and people just in general doing amazing work. And today we are joined by two design level members of the Design School for Regenerating Earth, uh, who will be sharing more information about their work in the Great Lakes, uh, Anna Papura and Elliot Grum. And um, so with that, welcome everybody. And thank you so much, Anna and Elliot, for taking the time to join us today. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. Just gonna share my screen with our slides. All right. And um, Elliot, would you like to start us off? Yeah, sure. This is a very intensely rehearsed presentation. So I <laughs> don't just talk to the slide here, Anna, or, or the, the next one over there. The, uh, yeah, just the, the, the title slide, I think. Yeah. So really swimming as a river, it speaks to how we as people want to swim in the river. Uh, particularly the Niagara River, but there's many rivers around here that you can't swim in uh, from time to time or at all because of how we've been interacting with waters and, and with the land. Um, so it's not just about swimming in the river, but it's about coming back into good relationships with everything that goes on in and around the river. Uh, so really it's about placing our perspective into that of the river and asking how we can interact with it in a good way uh, so that we can swim as it. And yeah, we're doing that through a bioregional mapping exercise. Um, yes, and so this is kind of a, a recap of the process that we've been engaging in uh, for a couple of months now. Um, so we're just kind of giving a, an overview of what we've been doing. And just to start out uh, a little bit about us is that we are members of the Design School for Regenerating the Earth. Uh, the people who have taken part in this have been primarily members, community members that live within the Great Lakes Basin. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we have focused on the Niagara River at being within the Great Lakes. But really, we wanted to um, pilot a process to, to help other people engage in community artwork and mapping processes. And we've been documenting it along the way to help um, to help anybody else who might want to do something similar for their watershed or their bioregion. And really what we've been doing is we've been learning to speak as the land uh, to really become one with nature and weave our stories of our place together um, across across watersheds, across bioregions, and really identify what drives our communities to action. That's the, the real purpose of developing that story of place. So when we first decided to, um, it, within the Great Lakes, start, start mapping our bioregions, we wanted to focus on a couple of things, mainly to tell stories about the biophysical characteristics of our watershed, the degradation challenges that um, it's facing, and then uh, the restoration efforts that are happening in that area. We want to highlight the groups who are working to restore the watershed. We want to make that visible to um, the general public living within that bioregion, but also make sure that they're visible to each other to support their collaboration. And we want to use this as a way to engage community members of all ages in the importance of water quality. So how can we make this accessible to someone uh, who's seven years old? How can we make sure that it's, it's easy to comprehend and um, very pertinent to them? And then we also want to make sure that whatever we create is also being used in those communities. So we want to make sure that we're providing resources for educational outreach initiatives. And that's one of the reasons why we selected the Niagara River was because we had that opportunity to provide these resources to people who 
are living within that area and organizations who would be using these maps. Okay, so this is not a passive presentation. Maps, they have power. They can help get us places and define how we see those places. So we are curious, a little icebreaker exercise here, how you see your watershed. So grab a piece of paper, grab a pencil or something to, uh, to draw with or paint with or whatever, and think of an indicator species or a keystone species, whatever comes to mind first, plant, animal, general um, watershed feature, and take about 60 seconds to draw that. Yeah, and I can, uh, yes, uh, yes, and I'll uh, start start our uh, our timer for everybody. So as long as everybody, I'm gonna give just a few, a little bit more time for you to grab your pencil and your paper and to kind of think about it. Um, and then I'll, I'll let you know when I'm starting the timer, but it can be really anything you want you want to draw. All right, so as long as everybody's ready, I'm gonna start our 60 second timer. All right, so uh, your uh, your picture does not have to be perfect, um, and uh, but that is our sixty seconds. And if you're open to sharing, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and we can um, share with each other what we drew. Uh, you can also just um, describe it too if you if you're uncomfortable with sharing. Uh, but we would like to, if you could, state your name, the watershed you are in and what you drew and why, um, then we can, we can go around and share. And I can get started. Um, what I drew uh, was a gull. I have to uh, unblur my background. <laughs> I drew a gull. It's not that, <laughs> it's not that great. It's pretty basic, but, um, I, my name is Anna. I live in the Niagara River watershed, um, really Lake Erie and Niagara River watershed in Buffalo, New York. And the reason why I drew a gull is because our, um, there's about 19 migratory species of gulls that come and live, um, that stop within the Niagara River corridor. And it's known as a, an important, um, a nationally, a, an internationally important location for migratory birding species, specifically gulls. We have some of the largest, um, the, the largest uh, presence of migratory gulls at certain times of the year, specifically between November and February. So gulls, um, birds that come down from the Arctic and up from the South uh, at both times of the year. So um, the gulls are actually, are very abundant here. And there's some gulls like the Bonaparte gull that is, we have the highest population um, at certain times of the year in the entire world of the, this specific type of gull. So migratory birding species are incredibly important to our, to our bioregion. Um, and Elliot, would you like to go next? Oh, 
Oh, he might have froze. Would anybody, anybody else, else like, to, like share? to share your name? Your name your... Sure. Oh, I think you might be frozen, Elliot. Oh, yeah, anybody. Okay, now you're back. Yeah, if you want to share. Okay. I used a scrap piece of paper, <laughs> something else. So that is a butternut tree. Uh, I was gathered under one this morning and there's a circle of people there and a fire, both the, the fire of the sun and the fire that we can make with trees. And um, yeah, there's, there's a lot there, but basically it's uh, about that eighth fire prophecy and about coming together uh, in peace and uh, harmony and to make good things happen. Great. Would anybody else like to share? I can I share. I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it though because I drew it in pencil. I don't know, is that clear or no? Yeah. So salmon in the Salish Sea and just, um, you know, the Chinook gather uh, around the mouth of the Fraser River and other tributaries. And, um, and there's just so much that's putting them at risk right now. And we've had record low levels of the rivers, like the Cowichan River right now is like, uh, so much is at risk right now. So it's just very much, and we're called Salmon Nation for a reason. Um, most of our ecology is actually very much tied to the salmon cycles. So there's there's a lot that's at stake as the oceans warm up and all those patterns are challenged. So yeah, really seeing it as interconnected systems. I misunderstood which is typical, the direction. So I wrote, drew what I remember from a map of the uh, the watershed and frogs, because I know our friend Margot Fass is a encyclopedic um, level person about the frogs in our area. She runs a frog house uh, in this area and she's nuts about frogs and she calls them a keystone species, I believe her. Green frogs are the only kind <laughs> that we got here. And I uh, did an embarrassingly bad drawing of a Canada goose because I saw some uh, yesterday or the day before. Uh, yeah, in the walk. I just want to show you, she's an artist as well, although she does less art than organizing people to appreciate nature. And that's something I bought from her. Isn't that gorgeous? I mean, it's hard with all the background, uh, but oh, maybe I can go like that. You know, it's just beautiful. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that is wonderful. Yeah, and, and just so everybody knows, uh, you can draw watershed features too. So you definitely did everything right, Victoria. <laughs> I, I can go next. Um, my name is Brandon, and I'm here in the Cedar River watershed in Seattle, which is a part of the Salish Sea in Cascadia. And I drew a seagull, so similar to Anna, but less sophisticated or educated. Um, and I drew a seagull because in terms of things that came to mind, salmon, octopi, certainly crows, ravens, but then also I think recently the most recent interaction I've had has been seagulls and seagulls are such a predominant feature around like all of our marine environments, whether you're on a ferry, whether you're down at the beach. Um, and then, you know, I certainly have a space that I work where um, fishing boats come in. And so in the, in the summertime, especially at sunset, you just get these amazing, um, skies filled with hundreds of seagulls all kind of gathering and feeding and um it's just a really amazing um experience so
Yeah, thank you. Uh, Beatrice, ha hi, good for you oh, to join us. Do you, would you I like to say care? one thing about what Brandon did? Um, when you discuss, when you talked about it as a, uh, not as a spectacle, I heard it like observing the life of this species. And that's, you know, we generally think of nature as beauty, but we don't see it as appreciating that there's another species that's communicating and they're very sophisticated. And the way we've been treating them is like they're stupid and they are anything but. So I think this is the thing that I, lesson I've been learning out of our work is that the more we can have our, and the paradigm shift that you talked about, Anna and Elliot at the beginning, those are the key things to, to shift people's thinking so that we need to you know, point it out because otherwise people might not notice it. They might just hear it like a story about pretty birds. So thank you for letting me say that. I think that's part of our work, transforming the way people see nature. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, we have Bia and Brad. Would either of you like to share next? Uh, Bia, you're muted. Masking to there. I got it. I got it. I got it. Do you hear me now? Yeah. So I think, as you know, I've I've just suddenly after two years of not leave. I live in Mexico. For some of you who that I mean, most of you I don't know, but I lived in the uh, um, in Chicago for many years and did by had my by regional initiations in in that area, um, and uh, so. When I think back, I mean, I've been away for a long time. I'm in a very different watershed now, but I have such fond memories of of that region. Um, one of the first things that we did when we started organizing as a bioregional group, just trying to learn, was that we had to define, that we felt we needed to define what the the limits, the the edges, where were, you know, where did, the boundaries, you might want to say, of the of the of the 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 that region that is Greater Chicago, but that's not how we wanted to call it. Um, well, we did realize that eventually through our early investigations that the original Potawatomi name for uh, of Chicago meant place of the smelly onion, and so when we because in the spring when the, there are a couple of rivers that run parallel to Lake Michigan, which is the main um, water feature, you might say. And uh, so so uh, we, I've just, I've got lost in history here a minute, but anyway, so what came to me when I was thinking now, and I only have a few minutes to stay because I'm, I'm visiting my sister and we have to leave in a few minutes in a little bit. But uh, what thinking about it wasn't a particular species that came to me, but the whole um, prairie ecosystem, which was even I lived in Chicago for many years before I discovered <laughs> that there was prairies all around and that that was what had really defined the region. And, and then we said about, you know, incorporated in um, educating ourselves on the prairie and its plants which are the most visible thing but the other really interesting about the prairie is that underneath it's it's though there's root systems and and life uh, you know species down under the ground that we normally don't see and um so to recognize that and to also recognize that the the fires that burn it's a fire it's not a fire resistant ecosystem it's a fire dependent ecosystem you need to have forest fires or not what not forest fires but prairie fires to maintain the 
you know, the ecology of the place. There was a lot of learning. I sort of give a fast overview and I didn't draw it. I was just thinking about it and remembering it with great uh, fondness and, and just gratitude for the opportunity that I had when I was there to get to know just the things that you've been, to, some of the participants you've been talking about, who, which are the uh, important species and when do they come and when do they, you know, migrate in and when do they go if they do, if the prairie, the plant, prairie plants, of course, just put down big roots and stay there <laughs> until they get up, undone for farming, turned into farmland or something. So it's just one of my, the first time I've been able to be available uh, to, to tune into this group and I hope to stay in closer touch. So uh, that's, I don't, I don't have a drawing, but I do have just a reminder. I know it's in a different part of the Great Lakes than where you, the, some of you were, but the, the prairies are just a dramatic revelation to me. And that's it for now. Thank you for describing, for describing that picture. It's beautiful. And thanks for joining us, B. I'm hoping to, to see you more often, too. I will make an effort. Thanks a lot. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Bye. Brad? Oh, still can't hear you. Yeah. Oh, it looks like maybe uh, a caterpillar or rivers convening. Yeah. If you want to type in the chat, maybe what you uh, what you drew, we can narrate it. It looks like we we lost him, so I will go back to sharing my screen. Uh, unless this is Brad here. Oh. Hi, Quinn. Hey, um. We actually just finished uh, doing some quick check-ins. If you would like to introduce yourself and share what watershed you're from, that would be great. Sure. Um, so my name is Quinn. This is Sean right here. Um, we are in Southern Oregon right now, but we're from Portland. And um, I guess it's like right at the, the mouth of the Willamette River, Columbia River watershed. So um, yeah, convergence of two major rivers. And um, how else would you describe our, our place? Our, our region. Well, I mean, we're Southern Willamette Valley, so. We've got both the Columbia and the Willamette weather systems. Um, you know, we're a temperate Mediterranean climate. It's a really good place to live. Um, you know, we are close enough to the coast to have the coastal ecosystem, and we have the mountain ecosystems. I, I would say, like, that is kind of the extent of our range. You know, like, we can do coastal harvests that are somewhat viable, you know what I mean? Economically, just like to get out there for things for days, do beach parties and then get up into the mountains for stuff. So I'd say from the Cascade to the coast, um, up the Willamette Valley is our, our primary watershed. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing because we also were just discussing, uh, we had drawn um, different aspects of our watershed. So thank you for sharing that, that, uh, that little tidbit too. All right. And then just getting back to our presentation. Um, so that was that was our our 
icebreaker. Um, and Elliot, would you like to talk about our mapping process? Yeah, so we're really just following some of those other great articles. I think some of them are written by Brandon um, about how to define a bioregion and that it is a living process and that it roughly uh, looks at what the cultural characteristics, the biophysical characteristics, and the ecological characteristics of a region are. Yeah, so um, in conjunction with that, that community artwork exercise that we brought to our last workshop, we also have been actually developing, um, well, working on developing uh, actual maps within a, a GIS software as well. Um, and one of the first steps that we took to, um, to start doing this was first identifying what and where to map. And this, this followed quite a bit of conversation within the Great Lakes as we tried to narrow down where we wanted to initiate our focus. So we started out by talking about what is the purpose that we're of mapping. Um, and we decided that we wanted to make sure that we, um, we wanted to make regenerative projects visible to the community and to each other, and also to provide a holistic view of watersheds and give information about why it's so important to have these regenerative projects. We also wanted to make sure that we identified who the interested parties were. So we identified the bioregions of our, our group members within the Great Lakes. And from that, we decided who would most be able to use these maps. And um, that's when we started engaging community partners. And um, I'm a volunteer with the Buffalo Niagara Waterkeepers. Uh, we do a lot of um, educational outreach in the community within the Buffalo River and the Niagara River watersheds. Um, so we have a lot of public facing events. And that was where we had decided if we're going to create maps, we want to make sure that we have something that can be taken out into the community and be distributed beyond just our group. So um, we met with the Buffalo Niagara water keepers. Um, Elliot and I met with them to discuss what might be important to them if they could use these maps and they were very excited to hear about our our project um and uh they did believe that we that they would be able to um if we had a packet of maps that we could share with the volunteers that we would they would be able to use it at tabling events and at outreach events so they also identified um specific maps that might be useful to them and gave us some information on where to look for for the data sets as well uh, but there were a, quite a few maps that just weren't really compiled or in a place that was easily accessible to volunteers to bring to events and um uh, for the most part really we we use a, a generic map of what the different watersheds are and uh some of the locations that um the Buffalo Niagara water keepers do water sampling in. But beyond that, there really wasn't more information in, um, in that picture form that we could share with community members. Okay, so <laughs> this is where it goes from, uh, anyways, the, the bit that I find less interesting and, and engaging to actually getting the very nitty gritty work done of acquiring the data. So that can get complicated when there's a border that runs through a watershed and the data is different on one side of that border than, uh, than on the other side of the border. Uh, sometimes where just where it's found, sometimes how it's presented. Um, so this is how we've been going about acquiring our data. Uh, Anna's been looking at the data from the United States. Yeah, um, so there are quite a few comprehensive data sets within the US and also Canada, but not really combined. That's what we found that there were very few maps that show both sides of the Niagara River. Um, so one of the places that we've been pulling for from the US is uh, local groups. So Buffalo Niagara Waterkeepers have, have data sets. Um, Birds on the Niagara is another. 
um, local conservation oriented group that has a lot of information on the different types of birding species that are um, located along the Niagara River corridor. We also um, have some artwork from a local artist who has uh, uh, conceptualized the Niagara River and different aspects of it, different toxins, different native species. Uh, we're using data from state databases. So the New York State um, Niagara River is totally uh, within New York State on the US side. So the New York State Department of Conservation has a lot of information on um, greenway projects. And then we also have some countrywide databases like the swim guide that tracks E. coli levels at different beaches and can identify where uh, where it's safe to swim and where it's not safe to swim, since that was our overarching theme for these uh, these uh, these maps is how can we make the water accessible to both humans and non-humans to swim in. And this is some of the area the uh, places that we've been getting data from in Canada, and I don't, I don't know how big that shows up, but even when you can get data there's all kinds of challenges in presenting it in a way that tells a story. Uh, a graph or a map, uh, it, the, the, the point is, is that it tells a story and that it inspires and connects us and brings us closer to where we wanna go. Uh, so in our case, this is just a little example here. <laughs> we wanna be able to swim in rivers. Part of the reason why we can't is because of sewer overflows. Uh, the data that is available on that basically just shows when the sewer overflow happened, at what location, and what the cause was. Um, and it's presented like this. So what we're trying to do with this data is make that a more compelling story that is able to inspire and connect people and bring us closer to the point where we can do large scale overhauls of all of the sewer systems that are not designed for the more sporadic and unpredictable and heavy rains that we are getting in this region now. Um, and then as we were developing these maps, um, we also decided that we wanted to um, include some community artwork. So these are some pieces of art from the people who had joined our previous workshop. Um, so we engaged in actually Claire helped lead a really amazing exercise uh, that was went beyond just drawing um, drawing simple figures or, or simple things about your watershed, but really incorporated the emotion that you can attach to, to different aspects of your watershed. So this is just some of the pictures from that workshop that people created. Um, and again, that's this is all adding to the telling the story and getting more of that engagement with the information that we're sharing. And one of the things that we were uh, piloting in the previous workshop was if we wanted to lead a community artwork um, a meeting around and do this actually on the ground in a single watershed, what would that look like? What are some of the activities that we could do? And as you can see, we got a, a wide range of things. We even had somebody um, uh, create uh, a, a turtle from items that he found in his his backyard beyond just um, drawing. So uh, people got pretty creative. Yes, and this is a slide from that community art workshop that we held uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and it's yeah, basically just a blown up version of that little 60 second exercise with many other layers and nuances to it uh, that we did at the beginning of this meeting. Um, and yeah, it basically asks, what's the story of, of your place? Um, Cause yeah, we, we are all experts of our place. Uh, doesn't mean that we don't have more to learn still, but we have something to contribute. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, this is what we did a few weeks ago. And I'd say it went very well. And 
I myself learned uh, a whole bunch of other layers that can be put into into an art piece. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I also, this is another slide from our previous presentation, but this is um, what we hope to do is as we're developing our packet for the maps, uh, it'll be a printed booklet that can be easily brought to events and easily accessible to volunteers, but that we would use something similar to what, um, this is a, a picture from Islands of the Salish Sea, which was a mapping project done in Cascadia in the Salish Sea um, that uh, brought together what I think like, was it 40,000 people or 4,000 people? Um, and the the thought is that we can use the um, some of the community artwork to um, create this this um, uh, collective cover to our booklet of maps, and we can in incorporate what people draw into this cover uh, that we would then be able to share with community groups. Um, and as you can see, the uh, the Sailor Sea community mapping they really incorporated a lot of artwork. Uh, it was not just GIS maps, but it was local artists that were drawing their place and really giving it their own their own story. Okay, so yes, next steps and outcomes. Uh, the uh, big big picture outcome is, of course, that we'd like to be able to swim in the river again in order to get there. Uh, this booklet of maps that we're pr producing is uh, one idea. And the next steps that we're taking to produce that booklet of maps is on the next slide. Uh, yes, so this is these are the different maps that we identified with the help of Buffalo Niagara Waterkeepers and some of the stuff that we had been discussing. Um, you know, what is really, what would you see in a river that is healthy that people would be able to um, safely swim in. So we have the the cover page with the community artwork that uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, we also wanted to include different wetland areas that are within the watershed, hard shorelines versus soft shorelines. These are really important specifically to Buffalo Niagara water keepers because their main focus is on creating living shorelines and removing those um, uh, the shorelines that are mowed right to the edge of the waterway or the um, the concrete um, shorelines that you see in a lot of um, urban urban areas and move it more towards soft shorelines or living shorelines with native plant species and um, native habitats. Uh, the Niagara River Greenway is are a lot of the efforts that are being made to restore the Niagara River. And that's uh, those projects we wanted to incorporate because those are some of the biggest restoration efforts, but um, also uh, there, there are other smaller efforts that are occurring as well. We also have a, a Niagara and uh, Niagara Falls, New York and Buffalo, New York has a very uh, strong community gardens network. So we also have maps from from that community garden that is really led by um, by communities. So it's it's all initiated by communities. It's on um, a lot of abandoned lots and trying to keep development low and green spaces high in these urban areas. So that's one of the things that we have on the west side. And uh, looking at combined sewer overflows. So where our sewer systems are when they there is heavy rain and it, it reaches its capacity, it will actually start dumping sewage into our waterways. So incorporating that as well is um, really key to understanding where some of the most polluted areas are on our waterways. Uh, we also have data on harmful algal blooms that are, are popping up, especially in the summertime and the heat. There's water sampling sites that Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper volunteers sample every month um, from pretty much March to November. Um, and they, they have a comprehensive um, report that they put out every year based on the, the health of that water, specific, not, drip, not for drinking, but specifically for the ecosystem um, that's based on 
uh, when it's both dry conditions and wet conditions, what, what kind of um, uh, different water parameters there are. Uh, beaches with color-coded e. e. coli levels. So what beaches tend to be safe? What beaches tend to be not safe to swim in? There's a lot of them along the Niagara River that are not safe to swim in for most of the year. Uh, we also have a list of different toxins that are present within the Niagara River, list of native amphibian, reptile, bird, and mammal species, and then also including the um, current and historical Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe territories, which are the two of the primary um, indigenous um, uh, communities that are that live along the Niagara River. Yeah, so this is really where we're looking to get to, is having this packet of maps that can be presented to and distributed by various community organizations. Um, the biggest one of those would be the Buffalo Niagara Waterkeepers that, that Anna works with. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Buffalo Niagara Waterkeepers is one of the largest waterkeeping organizations in the world. Yeah. yeah um, the largest. Okay, gold medal. And uh, yes, practice community art workshops. So, I mean, that's really what we're doing in the design lab here is we're just practicing uh, a lot of these ways of communicating um, so that we are more skilled at it when we go out into the world. Um, and yeah, that's the idea between behind developing this uh, community mapping lab as well. Um, yeah, and so that's our presentation. So we wanted to give some opportunity to uh, discuss some of these things. Like I know that Claire has been really, she she is very active in community art programs um, and anybody else who might be interested in uh, doing some sort of community mapping or community art within their watersheds. We wanted to give an opportunity to kind of share your thoughts, ask questions, um, and see where where maybe this might be inspiring you to do something similar. Yeah, I'd love to um, to just bring in because I kind of um, some of the things you were talking about. I know that the islands in the Salish Sea, one of the very key supporting pro um, programs was <clears throat> the mapping collaboratory at uh, the University of Victoria. And um, I remember going to a number of their workshops and um, they had like they had some of their students developing various aspects for citizen science in, um, input into the maps so that I, I, the one I do remember was like it was like a, a quite a complex spreadsheet but it was simplified down for people to put the information in, but they could basically um, drop a pin into where they were on the landscape and then put an observation in. And I think they were particular, you know, particular blocks that they could put it in, but it was a way of trying to connect, um, like actually have citizens engage in the mapping. So I just, they're an amazing, amazing resource. And if people haven't gone onto their website, I could maybe look it up and put it into the um, into the chat. They've been a little bit sort of, they've gone through a little bit of a transition, but I, we're, we're about to start working with some of the people that had been part of that and are now working in other areas. But um, yeah, they're very, very inspiring, but their website's incredible. So um, yeah, and so one, one other piece was just, um, Dr. I mean, Brandon could probably speak more to this, but Dr. Quilla Flowers, who put together um, the Salish Sea Atlas, her big project, and I think it's University of Western Washington, um, was trying to basically aggregate some of the some of the data so that um, between all the different jurisdictions, so that it could be represented on like the map of the Salish Sea. And so she's got various layers to that map and it's interactive and you can see and it's, she says that it's not, that the quality of the granularity of the data is not enough that they can be used by like government departments, but it's that it's to try and get the concept over. Um, but it's, it's really cool to go and see that 
but it's like I love that idea because it's really pushing the boundaries of these are whole systems and getting people to look at them as whole systems. So it's beautiful map to the Salish map, uh, Salish Sea Atlas. <clears throat> yeah, it would be great to see that website. Um, there are a number of organizations that have opportunities to add um, like different things like uh, like native native animals and birds uh, as citizen scientists to different maps, but that would be great to to see what they have. Hey y'all, um, this is a really insightful presentation. Um, I've heard a lot of like stuff about mapping starting to come into my awareness from different places and uh, Brandon's done a lot of cool things about that and I haven't really been a part of like a map creation process as much. Um, so it's nice to hear about the different things that you're considering that are relevant within the communities and on the landscape and then what maps would help kind of generate some more um awareness and whatnot and i just there, there's some interesting parallels between cascadia and the great lakes where it's like it's there, there's a border right in between um us and canada and more specifically for portland i'm sure this is in a lot of places but like sewage overflows and dirty water pollution um like, yeah, like it's it's a great goal that, and it's simple, just we want to be able to swim in our waters. Um, and I have some friends who are more into the mapping stuff and just kind of soaking this all in is really great to, to you know, be able to share this as I travel along to these different places and um, try to initiate some of this stuff, even if it's not my main you know, thing and then seeking out which organizations can really support this process and do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I'll say that there's a lot of interest in in mapping, at least kind of the larger Portland metro ecosystem of regenerative work mm -hmm. to try to build the network uh, of uh, transportation to actually get work done. Um, and there's a lot of different people from a lot of different parties who are interested in, in that mapping. And then I think, you know, Quinn and I are more on the side of like getting the work done, but the map can be really, uh, functional, you know, it can be effective at actually bringing people together. So, yeah, I wasn't expecting to be on this call and it's interesting to hear that y'all are doing this, um, because it's something that we've been talking about. And I think we have the partners that would be interested in putting the map together. I know Josh specifically, but, um, I can think of others, so. Yeah. Good job, y'all. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Victoria. I don't know what I'm going to say after I say great job. Uh, you know, I'm blown away. I'm um I look forward to seeing the first one. And if you could put it in the chat how we can go and get that. Because I'm a little clumsy in um, design school software and you know, social media, finding my way. Um, so you're talking about I the love, previous workshop? Yeah, the previous workshop. I think that every we can definitely, and this would be so great for people to be able to put their pen down on you know, where they are and say, I'd like to see this be like that, you know, like some criteria, you know, or however, we'd love to get a hold of whatever the tools are, because this is a natural for the property that Jonathan and I are partnering to regenerate. Um, and we just met with the community foundation this morning, and we really need to get to a stage where we could ask for the money with a with several partnerships of people who are used to getting money at the size that we need. 
to do the project. And basically she's coaching us into how to get grants from their organization because they'd like to see this happen. So, you know, that's, they, and she has a whole lot of discretion, but she loves the idea and the project of demonstration projects and uh, health and generating the land and teaching people how, to, so teaching people how to build their own house and uh, how to grow food and um, ponds and, you know, there's all kinds of things people can learn the skills to, to take it back to their properties and and regenerate their property. Why not, you know? Um, have everybody's property be this regenerative food forest or whatever. You know, we did that, but not everybody's going to do that, but let's compete to have the most interesting lawn, you know? <laughs> So I, I love this and I, I love whatever you're, you know, if you could make for us more concrete and um, describable the container in which this talk is, that would be helpful to know what's coming, you know, how you thought of it, about it so we can get in that frame of mind of expecting something from others or putting something together for people or. Mm -hmm. um, so I will say that uh Elliot and I have we we don't have any funding for this so it has been a fairly it's been a slower process because we um we are just kind of doing this on our own um Elliot is the one that has all of the GIS knowledge between the two of us and um one of the things that has been helpful though is um uh Peter Whitehouse and and Kim Chapel um from Case Western University, they, they were able to put us into contact with somebody who had access to a lot of data sets uh, that they shared with us. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we do have access to a lot of maps that are already created. And from there, essentially what we can do is, um, and this is something that Elliot could probably can speak more to, but create mm -hmm. shape files that we can extract that data in this certain area that we want to see and create the maps in that way. And then will it, will you be highlighting area, you know, red, yellow, green? Um, these are disasters areas. These are, they could be improved. And the others, you know, green is like, they're not bad, but they could use more work or, you know, something so people know where to put their effort. You know, teams know where, you know, I, I love what you're doing. I think it's great. Uh, and, you know, the art workshop, I know who can do that. So this is, Snowballing, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the main thing is, is that we're pulling from things that already exist. There's a lot of stuff that already exists, but one of the, like Elliot mentioned is they tend to exist in segments and not necessarily on both sides of the Niagara River. So you tend to see information that is just in New York State or just in Ontario, but not having that overall holistic view and a lot of times the data sets don't necessarily even match up correctly. So that's one of the things that we thought would be really helpful is if we have both sides, uh, similarly to you guys, both sides of Lake Ontario, um, there probably isn't really much information about the entirety of Lake Ontario and or Lake Erie. Um, it tends to be just the New York side or the Ontario side. And the implication is you can't fix a problem on one side if the other side isn't doing the same thing. You know, it's like, a, you know, Sisyphus rolling a rock up the hill. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. I and think it's, well, it's also an excuse. Look, what is Canada doing? You know, if we do it, what, you know, what difference is that going to make, right? So this... Mm -hmm you know, it's really important and valuable to get people on the same page. So there's no more excuses. There's there's a lot of people already doing this work on both mm -hmm. sides of the borders, but it's, the information isn't, a, a, I barely, well, I don't, I don't really have the patience. <laughs> if I had the patience, I could go through all of these 80 page documents and pull apart all of the data but sets. we need funding for, and the woman we met 
is on the committee of whatever joint thing is going on between Canada and the U.S. And we can get the name of it, but she has a lot of potential to introduce our ideas into the committee because um, she likes to make things happen and she's very creative and she has a boss who's very um, trusting of her and her wisdom. And they've just added um, environmental justice and sustainability to their, their funding and they didn't have it before. So this is all new. So it's, a, it's an opportunity to do something holistic that touches, you know, the public schools, nature education, uh, career development, you know, all of these things. We could do so much and they're interested. So that's great. Thanks. Thanks for stirring up all of these connections. Hmm. Yeah, I wanted to just draw your attention. I put um, a link to it's called Mapping Our Common Ground. And it's like a really, really amazing um, mapping process for community mapping process from the mapping collaboratory at UVEC. But they had looked at, they've worked with projects around the world or they've gathered from um, uh projects from around the world and it really is a very good resource like as i said it was like um but you know they they mostly are doing green mapping which is it is connecting the dots but what we need to go bigger to the the you know to the bioregional scale and some of them are most of this is focused on, on the green maps but it's just it lists some it, it's just such a brilliant starting point for just thinking about um, just, but just basically drawing on the wisdom that already exists. So, yeah. Yeah, and Elliot, I don't know if you wanted to to finish your thought from before or not, um, but just kind of combining uh, all the stuff that is already being done. Um, on both sides. Yes, and making it accessible to everyone um, so that we don't need to go through 80 page documents or pull apart data sets or learn how to interpret charts. It's here's the story, here's what's going on, here's how I can get uh, involved, and here's how I can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Oh, and thank you, Brad, for sharing where uh, what you were drawing the uh, the Grand Mesa and the the two rivers converging around the Grand Mesa. So that's beautiful. Um, yeah. So I I know that we're a bit over time, so I do want to let everybody go if anybody needs to leave, but. If anybody else has anything else that they would like I, to add? I do have another connection. I think knowing Annette Jimenez from Rochester um, uh, Community Foundation, being on this committee as part of a job for the Great Lakes, and knowing that we have people in Toronto, uh, Buffalo, and Rochester that could get on board with a, a U.S. project and fund it through a well-established organization that's trusted to take care of the money and do it effectively, like maybe the Buffalo and Niagara Waterkeeper, uh, to pay you to make the maps and you know roll out a program because they probably don't know how to do it. But we have this amazing network that's forming around uh, Lake Ontario. Yeah. And Lake Erie, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. So then we could use money to enroll the communities we need that surround both Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. And that would be pretty um, a pretty uh, amazing accomplishment and very doable. Mm -hmm. Given all the background that Brandon has and uh, Elliot has and Claire has, you know, we have the talent 
and we have the talent that can train other people locally to do this, and we could create models um, for how this is done and have it be for lots of large waterways that that have, you know, we could set up bioregional learning centers along, you know, a, a watershed that is normally divided by municipality or state lines that can't get something going because, you know, because of those boundaries, they can't get the money and at the right time. But if we take it as a bioregional uh, initiative that they all can get be behind and then raise federal money, you know, like that's what, that's what the feds want. They want collaboration. They want something to make a big difference. This could make a huge difference. Yeah, and I think um, one thing I just wanted to mention is I think that where we were coming from is more so, like Elliot said, making it a story and making it accessible to people. So we haven't mm -hmm. been super interested in all of like that, that really intense data set. Uh, mm -hmm. that like the real specifics, but not uh, really just making a picture that is would be simple enough for us to share with with children um, to kind of get a broader view and developing that holistic view. But um, and so much of that comes from that um, the community art and engaging in that process. But yeah, I think that, that I mean, that would be amazing if you wanted to. Um, we could uh, fundraise, you know, with that organization and a lot of others to undertake the story of place for you know, Lake Ontario, uh, Lake Erie, and bring all of these things together. And we may have a couple and we would interest be interested in having other communities up along the shore contribute to this and hire a regenesis group to create this, you know, landscape scale collaboration across borders and uh, bioregionally focused. I mean, it could change the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I, even though uh, I live 45 minutes from the border, um, probably even less, depending on which border you go over, I could get over the border and yeah, in probably 20 minutes if I went across the Peace Bridge, but um, it, Canada still feels very far away. That that connection across the border is is not really, really tangible to, to people in our communities. So, yeah. Yeah. It's it's such a social um, um, it's such a paradigm shift that it, people don't have to resist it because it's just not in the same <laughs> you know there's nothing to resist you know we want to do things by regionally guess what that means got to go across borders and we have the money to do it let's get our kids give our kids a real education in what it is to live in a bio region where the adults are collaborating rather than fighting and corruption. Uh, and there's decision-making that people uh, are happy to be part of and it's being well run and it's uses science and communication, you know. Uh, one of our people in this area and just in this, the great, in the Finger Lakes just came back from a workshop in Tennessee or North Carolina um, yes. at uh, what what is the Earth Haven? Earth Haven. And he came back really transformed. He's somebody who's been in the eco village world, built eco villages, built houses of cob, and you know, he's very talented uh, developer and open and you know um, he's in the Ithaca area. And he said about this workshop, he'd never seen all the pieces put together because uh, Earth Haven is about 30 years old and they just had people keeping at it and solving the issues. So now they have NBC, sociocracy, um, uh, basically they know how to make decisions. They know how to get people in and out when they need to be out because they've had that experience of when they need to get somebody who's being disruptive off of the out of the eco village, so they've gone through all the legal things, and they and they now have templates for how others can do it without making all those mistakes. Or at least he says this is brilliant, you know, socially. 
We're getting pretty far. I know, but it's the mapping. thing is, yeah. And and they're over time. We so. need to so uh, hey, people can leave, but we need to bring pro-social down to the working level. Like let's introduce pro-social along with the work that we're going to do collaboratively. So it's just part of it, you know, and weave the other things around it, however, so that we think it's packageable for others. So good. I'm on. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, Thank thanks, you. guys. Yeah. yeah, and I think our next mapping call, because um, we still have those biweekly on Mondays, we can definitely continue this conversation there. Um, I did just want to acknowledge that Brad asked for some prompts um, for doing this activity. And so for the activity that we've done, we, we started kind of doing it organically. I did put in the recording uh, from our community artwork exercise. Uh, the the part that Claire provided to us was really, really helpful. We did that that 60 second kind of icebreaker, those simple prompts for like what's important in your watershed. But I all um, Claire also added um, mapping our common ground. And there's also a couple workbooks called um, Boundaries of Home, ma Mapping for Local Empowerment. And there's also a, um, a workbook on community mapping that Peter Berg created that's available for $10 through Planet Drum. Um, I can add those resources when we, when we post this recording too. But those are all um, really easy to use um, examples. Um, which one would I probably not find, Brandon? Just out of curiosity, because I I have been able to to order the the Peter Berg ones. Oh, the Judy one. Okay. No, no. So the <clears throat> that would be the Peter Berg one. So you were able. They do have copies of the Peter Berg. Yes, they do. I was able to find it on the Planet Drum website, and I have one coming. So I'll All put right. them in. Yeah, I'll put the those resources in in the post. Um, but these the way that they're developed is specifically for community organizers and people to just kind of go step by step on how to run these community mapping exercises. So that could be helpful. Yeah. yeah. Just just to put a plug in, that common ground document is like fantastic, like really, really brilliant. So I don't know how much I would even add to that, like just from doing community community projects like it's brilliant okay well thank you everyone for for joining um and for staying over so uh yeah if anybody has any questions you can feel free to reach out to me or elliot or claire um and you're also more than welcome to join our um our mapping calls too within the great lakes hub those are bi-weekly on Mondays at 4 p.m. Eastern. If you're ever interested in joining and contributing, that'd be great. And otherwise, I hope everybody has a great weekend. Thank you both so much for running this. Thank you. Great. Brilliant. <laughs>